everyone. I'm Dave Richardson, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, or CLASS as we call it. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, outstanding symposium uh, that is being put, in, put on by a number of organizations and academic units at the University of Florida, uh, the Center for Humanities in the Public Sphere, uh, directed by Bonnie Efros, uh, should be congratulated on putting together such an outstanding uh, symposium uh, for you this semester. Uh, so, and we in the college in class are, are very proud to have her center in our college. But uh, more than that, we enjoy the opportunity that this gives us to get together with members of our university community to share our interests in the missions of the university, teaching and scholarship. Uh, as dean of class, I have the enviable pleasure of being aware of a lot of different things going on in many different academic disciplines. Uh, so, in a sense, over time, I've slowly become a jack of all trades, but I want to warn you, I'm a master of absolutely none of them. So, uh, take my remarks with that in mind. Um, the topic here for this symposium is death. And although scientists consider death as a biological event, it is obviously a topic that has significance for humans that goes far beyond biological definitions. One could argue, perhaps, that our human understanding of death is deeply related to Homo sapiens' rise from one, somewhere in the middle of the food chain to the top of the food chain. While many animals have responses that suggest that they are afraid of pain, and perhaps in some cases even have some sense of death. Humans are certainly the most knowledgeable about the larger implications for our species and societies. Certainly the rapid disappearance of many other species on this planet can be laid at the feet of Homo sapiens. But then, sadly, although we seem to be the masters of death in that regard, we don't seem to be able to avoid human deaths at our own hands and our own, through our own actions. Many insights can come from open conversations about this topic, which confronts all of us, all 7.4 billion of us, as individuals and members of communities and nations. So this symposium represents a fine example of the ability of universities, colleges, liberal arts tradition to, to tackle very complicated issues and far-reaching issues. We can connect many threads of a subject in a symposium like this that often defy narrow disciplinary considerations and analysis. And our first speaker certainly represents that tradition. Bonnie will introduce our first speaker in a moment. I just simply want to close by thanking you all for being here. I'm very much looking forward to our presentation this evening, and I would like to uh, introduce Bonnie. Thank you. and welcome. Um, this year, our speaker series will explore the enormous but often unconsidered place of death in pre-modern and modern human existence. While death was once fully integrated into everyday and community life, our attitudes toward death have changed considerably, especially in the modern and Western world. Death today has gained a certain irreality. Um, this struck me the other day when I was reading an article on the 15th anniversary of 9-11 on someone who was describing uh, the events at the Twin Towers at the time when those who were viewing people jumping off the, the towers said that it was until this moment that I thought I was watching a movie. It was so unreal. And it was this ending that was so unimaginable as it was unbearable that brought the reality of that moment forward. 
that acts of sacrifice, acts of generosity, and acts of martyrdom, and if you could apply it to this uh, situation, acts of mass suicide brought the reality of the moment. Death in our society is increasingly something seen to be as being necessary to be sanitized, forced into acceptable narratives, expedited, denied or silenced, and for some, avoided at any cost. Consequently, many human and cultural dimensions of death are overlooked, and we risk becoming desensitized to the kind of violence that is all too common and frequently sensationalized by our news media. Thus, with each of our speakers as our guides this year, we will engage the humanities disciplines to create a space in which we can consider death's impact on our lives by broader, broadening this discussion beyond the individual and the anecdotal. In the fall semester, we'll draw largely on modern examples. In the spring semester, we'll draw largely from the past. By means of historical, comparative, and intersectional perspectives on death, we'll mutually gain insight into the mechanisms that humans have evolved over millennia to rationalize, mythologize, theorize, cope with, and overcome its associated losses. Over the course of the year's seven public lectures and a film, our speakers will show us the shifting landscape of death and how different cultures and societies have sought to negotiate its complexities. Tonight's lecture by Professor Sanchez Prado will address the topic of more than 125,000 violent deaths that have occurred in Mexico since former President Felipe Calderón declared a full-out war on drug cartels. And he's going to suggest that we need to go beyond conventional explanations or euphemisms for the staggering figure, calling it collateral damage, and explore the prevalence of precariousness, unpredictability, and vulnerability is key to understanding death in contemporary Mexico. Indeed, he'll argue that the war on drugs is not one but a set of multiple wars that has escalated long-standing conflicts between different actors in Mexico, heightening class antagonisms and political confrontation, factors that have been sharpened in the neoliberal era. In such precarious conditions, including the erosion of citizenship and economic opportunity, and the political and environmental conditions that have stimulated mass migrations, people have been rendered more vulnerable and murder has become more commonplace. But before I introduce formally our guest, Professor uh, Sanchez Prado this evening, I want to give brief thanks to the many people and organizations that have made tonight's event possible. As many of you know, I was on research leave last year and it was Dr. Sophia Akerd who did a spectacular job in allowing the Humanities Center to grow in new directions and prosper. So I'd like to start by thanking uh, both uh, Sophia as well as uh, Dr. Jordana Cox, who was our first ever um, postdoctoral fellow at the center last year for their very hard work uh, at the center. And I'd also like to thank um, Tim Blanton, who's standing over there, um, who's the graduate coordinator at the Humanities Center. And I'd also like to thank Shared Services for doing so much of the legwork that makes events like these possible. Our series is made possible by the Rothman Endowment at the Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere. Um, as well as from the Office of Research, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the School of Art and Art History's Harn Eminent Scholar Lecture Series, the Smathers Libraries, the Department of History, the Center for Latin American Studies, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, the Department of Religion, the College of Veterinary Medicine, Alachua County Library District, the Digital Worlds Institute, and the Honors Program. As you can see, it really takes a village to make these events happen. Um, for more information about our series, including our next event, which will be a showing of the film, of the documentary, Thank You for Playing, as well as a Skype uh, it, uh, discussion with its directors on the 29th of September uh, at 5.30. We have placed flyers on the table over there to your right, as well as a sign-up sheet uh, for our mailing list. In addition to a question and answer period that will follow tonight's lecture, there will be a reception uh, in the uh, hallway just outside uh, of this room. So after months of planning, which have grown more intense in recent weeks, it's always very rewarding to see events like today's come to fruition. And I'm so very pleased to welcome our distinguished guest, 
uh, Professor Ignacio Sanchez Prado to Gainesville and apparently to Florida for the very first time, aside from the Miami airport. Um, professor Sanchez Prado is a professor of Spanish and Latin American studies at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, he received his PhD in Hispanic languages and literatures from the University of Pittsburgh. His areas of research include Mexican literary, film, and cultural studies, Latin American intellectual history, and comparative literature. He is the author of Naciones Intelectuales, Las Fundaciones de la Modernidad Literaria Mexicana in 2009, which was the winner of the LASA Mexico 2010 Book Award, Intermitencias Americanistas Estudios y Ensayos Escogidos, which he published in 2012, and Screening Neoliberalism, Mexican Cinema, 1988 to 2012 in 2014, which will also appear in Spanish translation later this year. In addition to editing eight essay collections with another two in progress, he's currently completing a book entitled Strategic Occidentalism, World Literature, and Post-1968 Fiction, He's also working on a project on the impact of the doctrine of popular sovereignty in mid-19th century Mexican literature, and he's writing a book-length study on cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism and genre in Mexican cinema. Professor Sanchez Prado has served as the president of the Division of Latin American Literatures and Cultures in the Discussion Group of Mexican Cultural Studies at the Modern Language Association, and he's also been co-chair of the Mexico section at the Latin American Studies Association. And above all, he's an incredi incredibly gracious guest, so I'm so very glad that we will hear him speak this evening. So without further ado, I hope that you will join me in welcoming Professor Ignacio Sanchez Prado, who will speak this evening on war and the neoliberal condition, death and vulnerability in contemporary Mexico. Thank you very much. I am extremely grateful of being here. Um, these are very difficult times for the humanities. We are... Uh, in, whenever there's cuts to higher education, we're the first line of those cuts. Uh, whenever someone wants to score a political point about higher education, it's always against us. Uh, we're in a state of, in which we really have to assess what is our value, and we have to justify ourselves all the time against forces that are trying to dissuade us from our work, from the importance of our research. Um, as Monique read my profile, I, I am not the kind of person that does reactive research. I'm not the kind of person that will work on the political issue of the day. Some of my stuff is about really obscure Mexican writers that I don't think anyone else reads but me. Uh, I also write about romantic comedy sometimes. Um, but I think that, um, and, and, and I say this at the beginning because, on the other hand, we have in Latin America in particular, these gruesome realities that are taking place every day as a result of globalization, neoliberalism, imperialism, and different logics that have defined the history of the region since its inception in colonial times. And one, in this defensive mode of the humanities, we're always wondering, what are the humanities to do in the face of these kinds of urgent problems? Especially, you know, I'm always happy to say and I, that this is, we have seen the failure of many, many intelligent people dealing with these problems. Mexico had some of the most brilliant economic minds running the economy for two decades, and the economy in Mexico is tanking right now, and it has tanked a few times. Uh, we've had all the, all the international organizations telling us what to do, and the situation of violence just gets worse and worse and worse. So I, I think that the, the humanities has to be very careful when dealing with issues of the present, because... Uh, we work on, on long-term social transformation rather than short-term social transformation. I think that the role of the humanities is to change frames of mind rather than immediate realities. That is why I'm very worried to talk about topics like the one today, uh, because I think there's an ethical responsibility in doing it right. I don't know if I'm going to pull that off. That would, you will be the judges of that. Uh, but one thing that I, it always makes me very worried is that it's very easy to be opportunistic with this kind of topic because it's in the headlines, because you will get grants, right? Because you will get people giving you 
all sorts of university benefits will think that you're doing, you can convince them that you're doing important political work, which is something that I'm always doubtful, because of the sense of immediacy that it conveys. Uh, I think that, on, that what I'm trying to do today with this work, which may morph as a result of this invitation into a short book project on the matter, is to take a step back from the sense of urgency and to really try to do what the humanities are supposed to do with this thing, which is challenge the frames of mind that conduct to this kind of violence. Uh, before I start my talk with this in mind, I want to deeply thank uh, Bonnie and Sophia and the Center of the Humanities for this very kind invitation. I'm very, very honored to be here. Um, I come from an institution that is a great institution in many ways, but much smaller than the University of Florida. So, so this kind of diverse community and diverse audience is always a privilege for me. Uh, and thank you, thankful to my friend Emily Hine, who's one of the rock stars in my field. Uh, old, uh, and she's teaching at the University of Florida now. And I can tell you, you scored a great hire. She's the role model of all the young women scholars in my field. So if you don't know her, I urge you to put her in, 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 in your map. My dear colleagues who are in different fields in the Spanish and Portuguese program here at the, the University of Florida, many of them are dear friends and interlocutors for many, many years. So. I would say that the part of the Spanish program that I know from the University of Florida is one of the examples of the great talents that the humanities has. And, you know, I hope that those of you who are not in touch with that program get in touch with that program because it is really one of the examples of great scholarship in my field and my discipline today. So it's a great honor to be sharing this space with these colleagues. I'm humbled that you're here. I hope you hear my remarks with a little bit of mercy. Um, because I know there are brilliant people with whom I have impassioned debates in many occasions. So thank you. It's great to be here. I'm going to start with my remarks today. When confronted with the topic of death in contemporary Mexico, the temptation to begin with one of the many stories that haunts the headlines is very strong. One could begin recalling the San Fernando massacre of 2010, and I say of 2010 because there was another one in 2011, in which 72 Central and South American migrants trying to reach the United States were murdered in a town in the border state of Tamaulipas because they refused to pay extortion fees. Readers of the international press would certainly be aware of the missing 43 students from the rural teacher school Raul Isidro Burgos in Ayotzinapa, Guerrero, who were kidnapped eh, because their political, of their political mobilization. And because their political mobilization seems to have conflicted with the activity of a local criminal group, a case that remains very much open given the deep ineffect and inefficacy of the government's response to it. Or one could recall the Tlatlaya massacre, in which 22 people, at least 12 of them believed to be unarmed civilians, eh, were tortured and killed by members of the Mexican army and by local police forces in a community located in President Enrique Peña Nieto's home state. And yet, as harrowing as the individual in killings may sound, everyday life in Mexico is also defined by the astonishing number of people killed since President Vicente Fox began ramping up efforts of militarization in 2005 and as a result of the so-called drug war, which is a notion that I will challenge a little bit later in the talk, as pursued by President Felipe Calderón and Enrique Peña Nieto. Security specialist Alejandro Hope, based on data collected by Mexico's National Institute of Geography and Statistics, estimates that if current trends hold, by the end of President Peña Nieto's administration in 2018, 310,000 people would have been murdered in Mexico in the 21st century. As overwhelming as these events and figures may be, the enunciation of numbers and stories do not suffice to make sense of this new reality of death. One of my claims today is that interdisciplinary scholarship in the humanities may provide tools to elucidate some of the cultural and social matrices that render this violence possible. In claiming this, I implicitly argue that the theoretical and critical tools of the humanities need to be deployed beyond the testimonial responses that have served as the first line of cultural defense when facing the question of political violence in Mexico and elsewhere. And this is, I'm gonna, this is the forewarning. I'm gonna, this is the controversial point of my talk today. The, the, the most valuable and first line of defense that cultural activists do is re registering history, re re registering testimony. 
That's a very important work. I'm not going to contradict that, but I'm going to challenge the idea that that's the only thing we should be doing. Because as we know, we have been living in a place where all of these things get widely documented, they get media exposure, like the Yotsinapa 43, and the system still works the same. Uh, the presidents that have presided these things, they're still in office, or they're still running around giving the speaking tours. President Felipe Calderón, after presiding 125,000 killings, was invited by Harvard to, give, to become a, a speaker. So I think that there's a problem that has to do not with the documentation of individual events, but rather with better understanding the larger set of logics that allowed for this killing to become possible. Some of them are economic and political, and their thorough study exceeds the field of expertise of someone like me, and we have to be modest about that. We're not going to come here to, to pontificate about economics. But there's also some discursive and cultural elements that allow for this killing to happen. And I, that's the, rim of the, the critical rim of the humanities as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I will elaborate this point in two parts. First, I will briefly discuss the limitations of the testimonial approach to Mexican violence. And then I will spend the rest of my time discussing ways of understanding violence in Mexico from the perspective of theoretical tools in the humanities. Testimonial narratives in literature and cinema and other media have been essential to present the historical memory of violence and repression in Mexico, particularly since the 1968 massacre of students in Tlatelolco, and continue to be an indispensable tool as a technology that gives voice to victims and provides mechanisms of symbolic persistence to the lives of those killed. This has been indeed the case of cultural responses to the events mentioned before. In response to San Fernando, various intellectuals wrote about each migrant in a virtual altar in the website 72migrantes.com, compiled afterwards in the book that you see in there. Ayotzinapa has also yielded a significant amount of testimonials, most notably John Gibler's Una Historia Oral de la Infamia, which gathers accounts of survivors as a way to counter government versions of the event, and Trino Maldonado's Ayotzinapa, El Rostro de los Desaparecidos, a testimonial that as he claims seeks to prevent forgetting the event, which in his view would be a symptom of a, the triumph of dehumanization and the logic of blood that rendered their disappearance possible in the first place. And I say disappeared and not killed because their killings haven't been proven. And I tend to be more frank than some people about it. They're probably dead. But al allowing them to be named disappear rather than killed allows for the demand of justice not to be forgotten and to not let the government off the hook regarding the responsibility to find them. It is not my goal to deny any kind of legitimacy to this effort. But the fact that one could, could not even begin to account exhaustively for all the textual production where killing in Mexico remains constant and insidious provides a compelling argument to the claim that one should not take this kind of testimonial discourse at face value or at the only, as the only possibility of engagement from the perspective of cultural activism and critique. I would even go as far as to argue that the predominance of testimonial discourse as the primary response to this kind of violence represents an, represents an impasse and a limitation in our ability to think critically about the Mexican present. Some problems of this approach have been extensively rehearsed in a scholarship on testimonial genres in the field of Latin American cultural studies. And that's a 30-year discussion, so I'm just going to give you a couple of references to that. Beatriz Arlo, an Argentine critic, for instance, contends that testimony, the testimonial mode from the Holocaust onwards pushes forward moral imperatives to carry a duty to memory that is informed, according to Sarlo, by a moral affective relationship to the past that is incompatible with the distance and the search for intelligibility that are part of the trade of the historian. Sarlo concludes that the legitimacy of the remembering subject in testimonial narratives does not have an, a relationship to truth itself. So what she's saying basically is that if you focus too much on the perspective of victims, and victims also have biases, and they have limits in their experience, there are things in their own experience they cannot see. So if that is your primary mode, what you are doing is you are creating a discourse that has a lot of moral primacy, but doesn't allow you to see the, 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 the full picture. So she's not saying that there shouldn't be those testimonials. She's saying... There should be more than those testimonials. The ethics of testimonial narrative may preempt the recognition of other possible operations of the discovery and aesthetic and political recovery. I would actually push this argument even further 
This form of elevation of the individual as victim or as the subject of testimony and memory is totally compatible with neoliberal logics tied to self and identity, placing under the erasure the important structural, political, and economic issues that, 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 that lead to these uh, situations. Maldonado's book on Ayotzinapa, for example, is based on the premise that the preservation of memory is tied to an understanding of community as that which must be pro protected or reconstituted in opposition to the state. This is an undeniably powerful matrix in social mobilization and in protest regarding Ayotzinapa. I would claim, however, that the concepts central to the imaginary of political mobilization and memory, concepts such as civil society, transition to democracy, and things like that, are equally central to neoliberal forms of political engagement in Latin America. So if you see all the pro-neoliberalism people, they are all in favor of civil society because it's not a civil society, right? But part of the problem is that a lot of the people who are killed, they are not participants of logics of civil society the way they are conceived by liberal political thinkers. So we have to challenge the very idea that civil society is what we have to, to achieve because there are barriers of entry to civil society that are based on class, race, and other factors. But that would be the topic of a different talk. It's a very complex issue that I cannot get to right now. Uh, more often than, uh, uh, compared to the impact that key testimonies of 1968 had in the public imagination in Mexico, I believe, and it is a controversial belief, that current works like these ones here have lost a significant amount of their symbolic impact. More often than not, they circulate as cultural commodities in niche intellectual marketplaces and as flooring signifiers of remembrance that really materialize in concrete practices of restitution or justice. Furthermore, as Alberto Moreira discusses, testimonial narratives often derive in what he calls a spectacular redemption, that is, the erratic call of absolute self-identity. This means, in English, not only the creation of a fetishized other or victim that achieves restitution mostly in symbolic rather than real terms, but also the emergence of culture as a machine that persists, in, More in Moreira's words, in refining extra-literary experience into mere tropes of a systematic representational po poetics. The way I would put it, cultural technologies institutionalized to make sense of death and violence in Mexico have gradually become more effective in sustaining the cultural capital of the intellectual class than in actually the symbolic thinking of the order of violence that structurally generates mass killings. And that is the warning that I always have in mind when talking about these subjects, because one can gain a lot of public authority by speaking about these things, and one very important question to ask whenever you see an intellectual talking about these things is, is this person thinking something substantial or are they just self-promoting? And I have to say that I have seen many cases related to this massacre that is more the second than the first, it, and which is the reason why I'm so worried about it. But it's also something that we have to say because I think that the reason why it happens is because the testimonials have lost the level of political impact they had back in the Holocaust or in the 1960s because of the enormous amount of information that circulates and the competing accounts that you have. And we have many parallel cases like Black Lives, Black Lives Matter, which as you know is very big in St. Louis where I come from. We know that they, they, they have been killed or that they're missing. And it still happens and happens and happens because denouncing it is, is, is never enough anymore. So then it really puts us in the position where we have to think what is the role of cultural activism whenever the thing that cultural activists have been doing for 60 or 70 years no longer works. It's a very difficult question. I, I, I have many activist friends who get really angry at me when I say this, but I think it is a critical question because you don't want to be risking your life and yourself in the name of a political strategy that doesn't work as it used to work in the past. Okay, so what do I propose? One such, uh, one, I would propose that there is, it is important to deploy existing tools of cultural critique, and I will show you some examples in a little bit, to think al be, not, not beyond but alongside memory and, and, and documentation. One such choice is a strategic move of the object of analysis from the rememoration of the dead to the logic of their killing. I recall here Joshua Oppenheimer's documentary, The Act of Killing from 2012 and The Look of Silence from 2014. If you haven't seen them, then in Netflix, see them, because they're 
absolutely spectacular, focused on the massacre of suspected communities in Indonesia, or suspected communists in Indonesia in the 1960s. Oppenheimer's methodological insights, which are very controversial on their own, are useful for my purposes. His testimonial documentary, The Look of Silence, focuses on the brother of a victim who is given the opportunity to confront some of the killers and collaborators. The striking thing is the utmost indifference with which he receives, he is received by the killers, and shows an important limit to the politics of truth and restitution, which require a corresponding act of atonement, or at least an act of admission to function. So if we know that the state did it and the Yotzinapa 43 are missing and then the president is functioning like nothing happened, then the, the logic of, of, of testimony collapses, right? But then, as we learned in the act of killing, which actually comes first, where participants in the massacres enact their murders with pride and playfulness, if you haven't seen it, he, somehow Joshua Oppenheimer I, I, I was able to make the Indonesian perpetrators of the massacre recreate their killings with mimicry and set themselves up as if they were in a Hollywood movie. It's quite, it's quite uh, disturbing to see. But I think that's a rich uh, thing because we see beyond testimony itself to understand the machine that produces killing which has to do with the emergence of a reason of state and a hegemonic order that by and large is still rule Indone rules Indonesia today. While he does not suspend memorialization of the victims at all, because that's what the second documentary is about, the symbolic economy of his films aims at the visibilization not of the victims, or even the perpetrators as such, but the social, economic, and cultural logics that generated the massacre in the first place. I propose to proceed through the same ethos, complementing the cultural work of memory with a claim for cultural theory's duty to unveil the symbolic economies and rationalities generative of death in the neoliberal era. This requires not only the elucidation of cultural politics of killing itself, but also the recognition of the political potentialities opens in the act of killing. So this last point I'm not going to discuss, but uh, if this becomes a book, the book that I think is going to become, there would be a segment of the book dedicated to what is the politics that can emerge from this killing, the progressive politics, the resistance politics, that is beyond memorialization? How can we, and one thing that, well, I will get to that later at the end, or in the Q&A. Following Oppenheimer's work, I propose to move from the look of silence, that is, the practice of filling with cultural meaning the harrowing signifiers provided by the face and the memory of the dead, to the act of killing, the cultural logic and political rationality for which death is an essential tool. A striking trait of contemporary Mexico is that regardless of having a death toll that is pretty much the death toll of a civil war and would seem incompatible with any notion of economic development, the functioning of capital and capitalism remains quite normal and even on the rise. In November of 2012, as Peña Nieto was about to assume the presidency, The Economist, which is the magazine I read when I'm in the Admiral's Club of American Airlines, because that's they have it next to Executive Golfer. Release a dossier called The Rise of Mexico. I'm not going to comment on the racism of the covers, but you can get that yourself. <laughs> Which contested warnings of the country uh, becoming a failed state. It pointed to the multiplication of shopping malls, so that's the, the sign of progress for them. The decline of net migration from Mexico to the United States, which is true. And the steady increase in manufacturing as evidence. Even in 2015, when the political crisis of the Peña Nieto administration became undeniable because of Ayotzinapa, the economist spoke of the two Mexicos and claimed that although Mexico's duality shows that getting macroeconomic policy right is necessary to success, but not sufficient, the country showed that the road to prosperity is hard and long, but possible. So that's what they were writing in 2015 about Mexico, which is really astonishing, but that's what they do. The point, of course, is not so much to mock the economist, which is very easy to do, but rather to point out that it is not uncommon in the con contemporary time for waves of crime and murder to exist with undeniable sense of economic growth and prosperity. If you go to St. Louis, we have the mass killing of African Americans on the one hand, and we have a new engineering think tank and Monsanto like being bought by Bayer, right, which happened yesterday, and a bunch of different things. So that, that I, I would say that the fact that one doesn't interrupt the other is the thing that we need to think through. 
And, you know, I think it has to be taught through by the humanities because it carries a cultural logic, but it really has to be taught more honestly by economists. And I don't think they do their job right in that regard. For the interest of time, I will not describe them in full, but I suggest reading Osvaldo Zavala's essays, those that are cited there, which seek to debunk the notion that Mexico's contemporary violence is due to a drug war. So he challenges the whole idea of the drug war. The naturalizing the idea of the drug war is a fundamental departing point to understand the act of killing in Mexico. Because the drug war has been so naturalized as the main concept in contemporary Mexican violence, many analysis omit the fact that the current regime of killing does not even have a necessary relationship to the drug trade, and it has in fact existed for over a decade before the drug war was declared. Before the drug war was solidified into public consciousness, as you may remember, Mexico was already experimenting a wave of femicides in Ciudad Juarez that dates as early as back as the early 1990s, and that in fact has not subsided, but rather just falling out of public view due to an exp exponential increase of murdering everywhere. The cultural politics surrounding these femicides in Juarez function in a similar logic to the ones described regard, uh, to the ones that apply to San Fernando and Ayotzinapa, a deployment of a complex politics of memory and a visibilization to counter the brutal misogyny that informs these particular crimes. The perspective of femicide has nonetheless opened the possibility of thinking killing as something motivated by the juxtaposition of two things. The first one would be identity dynamics, since the collective killings of Ciudad Juarez are generally understood to be related to the symbolic and brutal immaterial retaliation against women who have achieved precarious economic independence, subverting a patriarchal order further undermined by the mass unemployment of working class men. So Ciudad Juarez has a logic where young women have jobs, because that's what the factory has. But then it also has a mass unemployment of young men because that's the, one of the landing cities of men who failed to cross into the United States. So in a patriarchal social order, you can imagine the, the, the impact of a fully employed female population and a mostly unemployed male population have in family dynamics, in gender dynamics. So that is the generally accepted expl explanation of the murders, that there is a masculinity collective masculinity identity from a very, very patriarchal society that has been injured by this new economic order and that the, the violence and the hate in the kidneys has to do with the inability to accept women that have more economic independence and achievement than men. The second dynamic, though, which is the one that interests me here, is the dynamics of capital itself. The emergence of Ciudad Juarez as a precursor site of sweatshop manufacturing in the neoliberal era. Juarez offers an important key to moving beyond the privilege of testimonial, testimonialism, or there's a lot of that in the Juarez case, as it is one, the one site in Mexican killing that has been conceptualized in larger geopolitical questions. Authors like Sergio González Rodríguez and most prominently Charles Bowden provide a direct reflection of Juarez as a successful city in the constitution of the neoliberal order. Calling Juarez the laboratory for future, Bowden claims that the violence in, violence in Juarez is not a failure, but rather a glimpse into a historical process that happened there first and is expanding globally. And I quote Bowden. All other things happening in the world, the shattering of currencies, the depletion of natural resources, the skyrocketing costs of food, energy, and materials, are all had in Ciudad Juarez. Years ago, hope moved beyond reach, and a new life was fashioned, and now it crowds all notions of life in the city. This new life, is the counterpart of the new debt, which I would argue has moved beyond Juarez and gradually overtaken the whole of Mexico. The act of killing is central to this new social order, which I would call late neoliberalism. The disappearance of even the liberal myths of development that fostered 20th century imperialism and the reordering of society on the basis of new regimes of labor and exclusion. Focusing critical attention solely on the identity of the dead obscures this new rationality of the state and capital because the very category of the dead is populated by various different subjects in various different social positions. So what I'm asking here is, the question is not who, were, who was killed, but who's killable. Because you can trace the cultural and di dynamics and logics whenever you ask, not who's being killed, but who's vulnerable to killing. 
I was vulnerable to killing in Mexico. Women, Central American migrants, drug traffickers, and of course, bystanders. The question of the bystander is very complex. I didn't include it here because it requires a different framework, but I will focus on the other three. Um, this is compellingly represented in Maria Rivera's poems, Los Muertos or the Dead. In the, in the link you can read the whole thing, and there's a video of her reading, reading it in Spanish in a public square in Mexico a few years ago. One of the most celebrated cultural texts engaging with Mexico's contemporary violence. Rivera structures the poem as a litany that fluctuates between the third person plural. There they come, the beheaded, the handless, the dismembered, the places of origin of death. There they come, the dead who left Usulután, La Paz, La Unión, La Libertad, and the names of the killed. They are called four children, Petronia, two, Zacarias, three, Sabas, five, Glenda, six. Noting not only the irreducibility, irreductibility of the dead to individual stories, but also the patterns of grisly repetition that suspend individuality through collective horror. The focus on identity and identification has an ambiguous ideological effect insofar as it dissociates the dead from the social assemblages that made their killing meaningful, possible, and even necessary in the rationality of the new social order. It is true that there is an act of distributed resistance in doing so, remembering the dreams, the life, and the affects of the victims, is a way not only to pay tribute to the brutal incorporation of their bodies to ever more violent logics of production and surplus value. This is why the notion of femicide privileges the gender nature, nature of this violence with good reason. But when doing so, within a limited notion of identity politics, the assemblage of these women into the order of capital gets forgotten. In an exceptional work on this question, Rita Segato shows why we need to understand both things together. And Segato, these are a quote. The Ciudad Juarez femin feminicides are not common gender crimes, but corporate crimes. And more specifically, crimes of the second state, of the parallel state. They are more similar, by virtue of their phenomenology, to the rituals that solidify the unity of secret societies and totalitarian regimes. That's Segato. Segato is by no means blind to the gender specificity of the crime. She is a feminist. These reflections are preceded by one of the most thoughtful reflections on questions of rape and violence over the body in discussions in Juarez. But the individuality of each victim and of each criminal act perpetrated on them does not occlude in Segato's argument the fact that the corporation responsible for these crimes is, and she says, she describes it, a group or network that manages the resources, rights, and duties proper to the parallel state and establishes something that cannot be described as a process of accumulation in the old Marxist sense, but rather a new logic in which, Segato again, the finality of capital is the production of difference uh, through the progressive reproduction and widening of hierarchy to the point of extermination of some as the incontestable expression of their success. So the way Segato will read the, the, the mass killing of African-American men is this. It is a class war that kills for the sake of killing as a representation of the social success of the killing class. But this also has an important logic. This actually allegorizes the place and position of all the dominated, the nominated people or the nom nominated class. Although Segato's argument seems to lead sometimes to identity politics, in fact it's a compelling illustration as to how Ciudad Juarez is not only the laboratory of our future, but rather a sort of ground zero for class war and class struggle based upon a terrifying, without limit, of economies, symbolic and material. This is precisely what the act of killing does. It inscribes into the body of the dead the terms of a new social hierarchy and a new order of economic production in which domination is more brutal and more radical and which constructs a new society based on deeper social antagonisms whose semiotics are defined in consolidating new regimes of life and death. When we moved from the concrete side of Juarez to the generative dynamic of killing that be, uh, behind the hundreds of thousands of deaths in Mexico, there is a clear need to understand the core mechanisms upon which killing becomes a technology in the new order of capital. In a recent book, Sergio Villalobos Ruminot, a Chilean scholar, 
develops the idea that violence in the contemporary world is not so much a new phenomenon, but rather an intensification of metamorphosis of forms of violence that have always accompanied colonialism and capitalism, ethnic cleansing, military intervention, and so on. Produced by an acceleration in this case of compulsive modernization. In his argument, Juarez, in Juarez, Violence is a factor of rapid urbanization and industrialization brought forward by emerging post fordist economic models. This points to the need to think the act of killing to this imperative of compulsive modernization at the level of body and its assemblages. The logic that needs to be further theorized is therefore the deconstruction of the idea of the citizen into a link of chains of production in the new ways of employment and labor. If one removes the fear of the bystander, which has, as I say, is a, it, has, it has other logics, it becomes clear that the common denominator that renders a person killable in the current neoliberal regime is his or her participation in new regimes of exploitative labor. Women in Juarez are tied to a new body of labor based on young women who are subject to various layers of gender violence and discrimination. Central American migrants push out their country by diverse sources of violence. So in Central Americans migrate because of the Maragans, because of the drug trade, because of the remnants of United States foreign policy, and not the remnants, but also the present. You know, the Honduras has to do with the coup that took place in 2009, with very much the support of the, of the, of the government, of the U.S. government, are in many ways part of diverse economies of exploitation, from the recruitment to sexual trafficking and extortion networks in their past to Mexico, to their integration of the undocumented labor force in the United States. This is also very much the case of hitmen and their victims. This is quite a, quite a read, so I really recommend you look this piece. As Rebecca Byron has shown, hitmen are essentially paid labor to, in a production regime that considers leaving people raw materials and dead people the product, while the act of killing generates wages and employment for the killers themselves. Part of the point here is that there is no Mexican exceptionality here. Central American migrants, for instance, are part of wider networks of trafficking and forced labor in the United States. So if you think of a Central American migrant from this logic, they work in, in employment, you know, in, in, field, in fields and in construction and so on, but they also work by being subjects of extortion, they also work by being subjects of sexual trafficking, because there are different ways of working and generating profit and surplus value. Sometimes it's in your will and sometimes against your will. Sometimes it's because you are the worker and sometimes because you are the raw materials. So she says, we have to, what Byron says is, we have to understand killing as labor. People get paid for it. There's a product, which is the corpses. It produces e economic logics. So the fact that you are killable makes lo your labor cheaper and more profitable. So there's a bunch of different dynamics going on in here. So to be killable, to be a potential death, is the effect of the potential of the bodies assemblage to concrete networks of neoliberal post production, whether as workers, who are workers, such as manufacturers, farm laborers, drug mules, hitmen, or as raw materials to be turned into com commodities, corpses, forced prostitution, slavery, etc. This has become a central component of cultural productions concerned with Central American migrants. So I'm just going to mention three for the sake of time. It, I'm going to mention the first two and go into the first one. So one is this film, La Vida Precoz y Breve de Sabina Rivas, which is about a, a Central American migrant that gets stuck in Chiapas and forced into forced labor. She wants to go to the U.S. to become a pop singer. And there's this novel, La Fila India, which focuses on a human rights a government official who gets trapped into the networks of trafficking in, in Chiapas. But this is the one that interests me the most. The third example is the striking reality show Borderland, produced by Al Jazeera America in 2014. The show, do you see this? This is astonishing. The show gathers three proponents and three opponents of immigration, of immigration reform, and has them follow the trail of Central American migrants who died in the Arizona desert from their hometowns in Guatemala through the harrowing train ride of La Bestia all the way into the United States. So it transforms the migration route into a reality show, basically. And of course, you can imagine the scandal that this has generated. 
The series, however, is in itself instructive about the efficacy and limits of the testimonial mode. One of the opponents is a textbook case of the way in which the story of, uh, the, story of the testimony actually changes minds. She is a white ev Christian evangelical woman, the blonde woman in the photo, uh, with a background as a political operative of the Republican Party, who becomes a proponent of immigration after the show because the harrowing plight of the migrants is, is uh, narrativized through her religious beliefs as an evangelical Christian. Yet, a more fascinating case is that of the African-American female fashion blogger from Las Vegas, uh, who, ha who holds radical anti-immigration politics informed by uh, the experience of a car crash she had with an undocumented migrant. She had negative effects on her life. She not only refuses to complete the trail, but also is the one, the one person that fails to be converted into any kind of minimally empathic perspective towards the Central American migrants. The reason is clear. She also has a testimony of her own, and the force of her personal story has no effect in so far in having her change her mind, because she, there's no framework to allow the story of the Central American migrant to be meaningful to her. The palpable futility of this shows as a morality tale, because only one of the six participants actually changes her mind, the, the blonde woman, unveils an important reason why. None of the six participants of this show are connected to the economic or labor dynamics of Central American immigration. They don't understand Central American migrants as workers. Two participants have purportedly ties to immigration. One is a farmer who regularly hires Latino labor, but claims to not know their immigration status for a fact, which is an interesting claim. And another one is a community organizer who migrated legally from Nicaragua. They belong to social positions that acquire respectively economic and symbolic capital from the politicization of the issue of immigration, but are generally blind to the regime of labor itself. What borderland renders visible is precisely the invisibility of the assemblages of capital in the everyday life of the immigration debate. So what explains this? Here one should raise the presence of the dynamic of precarization, and that's the bibliography if you want to learn about it, insofar as the condition of possibility of this new regime of sovereignty is the construction of regimes of the body and the self fully aligned with the transformation of victims into workers and commodities. So it originates, the, the debate originates after 9-11. Uh, Judith Butler's book is about the precarization of uh, Muslim prisoners in places like Guantanamo. So it was a, a legal category about the loss of, of habeas corpus citizens. But it has evolved in a decline of the notion of citizenship and the, 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 the decline of economic protections. If you want to read the economic argument, that's Saskia Assassin's book, which is re really fantastic. I would contend that a close analysis of Mexico's violence show that precarization is not a category of citizenship or a decline of the reach of the state, but rather a reordering of general geopolitical lines based on global, of, lo, uh, of global labor structures due to concurrent events like the end of the Cold War, which opened the old communist world to capitalist expansion, the intensification of global free trade due to NAFTA and the WTO and other agreements, and Mexico is one of the countries with the most trade agreements in the world, and resource wars and displacements due to climate change. So Sassen actually talks a lot about climate change in her book. The reconfiguration of Mexican labor is thoroughly linked to these logics. NAFTA in particular and free trade in general fully reorganized the protectionist national economy of Mexico from the 20th century into an export economy based on precarized manufacturing work. The combination of NAFTA's opening of Mexican markets to the global agribusiness and the destruction of agricultural land due to climate change and criminality have been essential to the rise of both rural migration to cities and the U.S. and to the drug trade. I find that the best description of the regime of labor as found in late neoliberalism is the one rehearsed by Saskia Sassen in Expulsions. Sassen does not use the word neoliberalism or precarization even once, but her account of the contemporary global economy is absolutely essential to link the act of killing to both labor dynamics and biopolitical sovereignty in the neoliberal era. In her, in her analysis, Sassen points out that the core dynamic of the global economy is a series of expulsions, which include not only the withdrawal of welfare state benefits to the northern middle classes, but also what she calls the expulsion of the life space, that is, the expulsion of marginalized people and even non-human actors from the biosphere as a result of global warming. 
the logic of these processes is what Sassen calls savage sorting. So I'm going to skip a little bit or, or do it a little bit faster uh, to, to explain the point. What, what is happening here, and this is very much explained by Ayotzinapa, is that the act of killing is a, an act of social sorting. What it does is that it tells you who's inside and outside the structures of, produ of, 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 of production, who gets exploited and who doesn't, who gets into which labor regime, the legal or the illegal, the desirable or the profitable. So it is about managing the new labor force in the global economy. That's basically the fundamental argument. And one of the reasons why this happens, and this actually accounts for Ayotzinapa in a very significant way, is because we have lost the protections that liberal democracies created in the 20th century, like unionization, workers' benefits, and so on, on the name of ideas such as flexible labor and things like that. And that has left an enormous amount of people killable. Right? There's people who were able to preserve their ways of life in agriculture who have been expelled from the communities because of climate change. So it is an aggregate of different things that is doing this. In the case of Ayotzinapa, for example, the, the key fact to know is that the state to, or the government of Enrique Peña Nieto passed a, a reform, they call it an education reform, which is a lie. It's a, it's a labor reform of teachers. And it has two interesting characteristics. The first one is that it removes basically all the labor rights they had won in the 20th century. So, which is a very crucial thing because being a teacher in Oaxaca is the only way to access the middle class if you are of a peasant community. So when they take, you, when they take away your ability to get a, a permanent position, right, the idea of being evaluated to then be kicked out because you didn't pass the evaluation, all of those things destroy the livelihood of the only path to the middle class that ever exists in, in the poorest states in Mexico. So these students are at the middle of it because they are the ones who were not going to get the labor benefits that a teacher should have gotten in the past 70 years of Mexican history. You can see that the students, the, the teachers are marching, the teachers union is marching in Mexico every single day as a result of this. And for years. And the second thing that is going on is that Ayotzinapa is a, is a rural teaching school. It is a place where you learn to teach peasants and indigenous people. Because these are people that come from impoverished communities or teach in impoverished communities, they are very, very radically politicized. Guerrillas have been born in this movement, so there's a vested interest in the, of the state to defund it. So they have been defunding it. They do things such as not publishing the admissions process so no one enrolls, and then they can claim that no one enrolled, and then they can close the school. Very Mexican form of proceeding in politics, if you know anything about Mexican politics. So they are destroying the whole base that has allowed education to be a factor of social mobility in precarious communities in Mexico. And the interesting part is that the people who are pushing this is an NGO, is his, the, the name is Mexicanos Primero, is run by this guy called Claudio Gonzalez, who's one of the, who's one of the richest men in Mexico, who came to the U.S. He thought that the evaluation system of the U.S. was working great. And then he went to a place, to a place where it's even more destructive. And this is a rich guy that has the ear of President Peña Nieto, and he thinks that because he's rich he knows about education. You may remember Mr. Bill Gates for the same reasons. And it has had the enormously disastrous consequences in rural, in rural education in Mexico because these people who are pushing these reforms do not know the first thing about how rural education works. Uh, and that's why, that's why these, these kids get killed. They were pre getting prepared to protest the reforms when they came out to collect money and to get buses to go to Mexico City to protest, they didn't realize that they were obstructing some of the trade by the drug cartels because the place where, where they're from is where most of the heroin produced in Mexico is produced. And the cartel thought it was, they were a rival cartel and they just snapped them and disappeared them. So probably they killed them and burned them or something. But it is because they are they have to be out exposing themselves to this because if they did not, if they do not fight the labor reform, the only other job employment opportunity that they have in that state is the heroin trade. So you can see that it is the precarization of their labor and that's their job. You take away their 20th century liberal democratic job as teachers, what can they do? They become precarious workers migrating to the U.S. to come work in the fields in here or they become precarious workers joining the lower ranks of a drug cartel where they're probably not going to live beyond the age of 25. 
So, to not end in this depressing note, I will conclude my last couple of minutes with a hopeful note. Proposing ideas regarding the ways in which the impasse of testimonial politics is slowly being overcome and the ways in which culture and critical work have begun to think beyond memorialization. Uh, I follow here my friend Samuel Steinberg from USC who, re who, who calls that to, to the fact that we have to reject the idea of sacrificial memory. And rather than focusing on the memory of the victim itself, we have to focus on the memory of the victims of violence. So we're going to focus on the disappeared of Ayotzinapa. What we should be doing is not remembering them and writing book after book after book after book about their lives. But we should fight the education reform because that's what killed them. Um, what Steinberg suggests it's a counterpolitics to, this, to the dynamics of testimony and sacrifice in honoring not the memory of the victims, but rather the values and demands underlying political mobilization. We see, for example, that uh, one thing that has been happening is that people uh, solidarity with Ayotzinapa have started connected with the Black Lives Matter movement and they have done Ferguson Ayotzinapa protests all across the United States because racial violence is a sorting of labor. One of the reasons why they imprison so many people is because a, a population that, that has high, very, very high rates of unemployment becomes very profitable as prisoners rather than becoming subjects of welfare in the, in the public arena. So there's someone, if someone is in jail, there's a lot of people making money. So that's why the mass incarceration of African Americans has a thorough uh, 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 economic dynamic that in a society that is unwilling to provide meaningful employment to, to African Americans. I mean, I live in St. Louis, I can tell you everything that happens in St. Louis about it because that's where Ferguson is located. The last thing I will do is read, uh, no, I'm not going to do it, I'm just going to conclude here, but another example is the movement for, of peace for dignity and justice by poet Javier Sicilia, who's a very good example of, how, of this politics in action. Javier Sicilia is a, a well-known poet, he's a well-known Catholic poet, uh, his son, was, uh, was killed uh, because he, was he and his friends were confused by a, hit by a gang as members of a rival gang. Uh, the, one of the narratives that President Calderon tried to do to, to justify the killing is that everybody that gets killed is because they did something. So Cecilia fought against this logic. And he has built a movement in which he says that honoring the memory of his son is not about telling the life of his son. It's about fighting the machine that allowed for his son to be killed so other children don't get killed. So I'm going to conclude with that. I'm very happy to answer any questions or comments that you may have. Thank you for, for your time. <laughs>